Hello, and welcome to the Modern Persian Food Podcast. We are food bloggers, Bita Arabian and Bita Nazim Kelly, and we're here to share with you the rich flavors and fresh ingredients of Persian cooking and how to incorporate them into today's modern lifestyles. We're so excited to introduce you to the flavors, tastes, and techniques we use in our own stories growing up in Persian American families. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to episode eight of Modern Persian Food. Today, Bita and I are going to talk about khorisht, which translates to stews, but it may not be the best translation, but we'll get into that. We'll be talking about how the braised meats and vegetables and sometimes nuts make this hearty sauce or stew that we serve over white rice and have with our friends and family when we want to celebrate or when we want to have a great hearty meal. Hi, Bita Jun. Hi, Bita. I'm so excited to talk about khorish because they're just so delicious. What are some of your favorite khorish that you like to eat and to make? Well, I really like to eat khoresh, and I wanted to add that in addition to the things that you said are in our saucy stews that we have with rice, our beans, don't forget about beans. Yes. And legumes are so good for you and nutritious. And I think that my very favorite khoresh is khoresh mm-hmm. I love eating it. I do actually know how to cook it, and I made it last night. Tell us about khoresh Actually, the Farsi way to say it has like that throaty G sound that I'm not so good at. And I'm just going to say it in an English pronunciation, which I'll butcher it. Game. <laughs> game. That's the way my girls say just game. Yeah, that works. That word actually translates as a small chopping of meat. Mm-hmm. But I think that a main ingredient in there is yellow split peas which I believe is a type of legume, but very nutritious. Yellow split peas are not lentils. They look like yellow lentils. They're actually a pea that's split in harvesting. So you have to be really careful with cooking them. They can get mushy, or if you don't cook them long enough, they can be sort of crunchy. So it's a fine balance of cooking it. Mm -hmm. And so when I started learning to make it at home, I learned that you can actually buy varieties of yellow split peas. You can buy from a Middle Eastern or Persian market. The Farsi word for yellow split pea is lape. You can buy slow cook variety that in Farsi is called deer paz that helps with not getting them to be mushy. Some people will go as far as cooking their yellow split peas separately Mm -hmm. from the meat and onions and sauce and then add them at the end. I do first cook the onions and meat, but then I try to put them in as soon as possible so that they get the flavors and the spices. And this is a dish that is sour with the limu amani dried lime that I love. And on top of dried lime that I put in there for flavor and sourness and tartness is I also put lemon juice and salt. I love that dish. And French fries on top. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's the best. Do you eat khorish yeah, I really love khorish ghema. I don't really make it, but I really enjoy it. And those French fries on top are like such a treat. There's some potatoes that kind of get a little bit more soft that absorb some of the fluid and the liquid of the khorish itself. And then the ones that are crunchy on the top, it just has a nice textural difference when you're eating it. It also has a little bit of the tomato sauce in there, like tomato paste, which I think adds a little bit of the tartness to it as well. And typically... I think that gheme is made with red meat, but you make yours with chicken, right? Yeah, you're totally right. So it is traditionally made with either lamb or beef. I do make it with chicken and I have a lot of cheats for it. My mom started the first cheat growing up. She would actually slip out and buy McDonald's French fries to put on top. (sighs) I like to use my air fryer to make French fries. And with the air fryer, you don't actually even need to use oil. You can just make crispy things in there and have it be healthy. If you want a quick way to get crunchy potato taste, you can buy shoestring potatoes. Do you know what I'm talking about? They're like chips. They're like tiny little chips. Yeah, and they come like in a little canister. Are they freeze-dried potatoes? I don't know, but I can just eat them (laughs) like chips. Yeah, they are fun. That's a great cheat because if you're not running out to go buy fresh French fries or don't want to deal with frying them or air frying them, it's kind of hard to pull that off midweek if you're going to be making French fries from scratch for this dish. So yeah, shoestring potatoes are like a great cheat to put on top of it to get the flavor and the texture and also the visual appearance of it just makes it look beautiful. The sauce itself of the reme is like a rich 
orangey ready brown color Mm -hmm. and then with a bright yellow shoestring potatoes on top of it that makes it fun yeah and i thought of one more cheat when you said that about the tomato paste is we sometimes use ketchup either in the place of tomato paste if i don't have tomato paste or last night when i made it i used both regular tomato paste and ketchup so it gives it like a sweet tart oh wow i've never tried that Yeah, my mom does that a lot. She'll sneak in some ketchup, and I learned that from her. Oh, how fun. When you said in our intro that it's not necessarily a stew, what did you mean? I think traditionally when we think of the term stew, it kind of feels like it's like a humble hearty dish that's kind of standalone, like a beef stew. When I heard the term stew, I just don't feel like it accurately represents what a choresh is. The choresh usually starts off with like sauteing and frying of onions and then whatever meat. You can really use whatever kind of meat that you want. You can use beef, you can use lamb, you can use chicken. You don't even have to use meat at all in most of these dishes, which makes it really great for people who don't want to be eating meat or want to have like a vegetarian or vegan option. You don't need to use meat. Then it's slowly adding vegetables that are braised. And we serve the choresh on top of white rice. So you make the rice separately. When you want to serve, you serve the choresh in a separate dish or platter, then you serve the rice. At the time that people are going to be eating it is when you actually add the choresh on top of the rice. You don't mix it all together. The choresh usually sits on top of the rice and you kind of start from one side and start eating along. So each bite has white rice and the stew on it. It's not like a mixed rice dish. It's just two dishes that are served together. Thanks for giving that visual because it's kind of hard to explain or describe because it really is not a stew. Like stew, like you said, the connotation is it doesn't feel like something you would make for company, but you can absolutely make a very nice, elegant choresh Mm -hmm. for company Mm -hmm. and friends and for a nice meal or a dinner. And it's not just meat and potatoes that you eat in a bowl with a big huge spoon on a cold night. It can be comforting, but it also can be kind of elegant and fancy. And I think that's what's different about Horesh. It's almost just a sauce. There's nothing like it. Yeah. So it's unique. Just like us, Bita Jude. As you guys know, (laughs) Bita means unique. So since both of our names are Bita, we can categorize Horesh in that too. At the same time, I can eat my favorite Horish plain without rice. That's just me being maybe very westernized or overly healthy. But sometimes if I really like it and I don't want the carbs of rice, I personally can eat like four masabzi or one that's really delicious mm-hmm. in a bowl. I can eat it that way. But How about you? There's definitely times where I can have a small bowl of it just as a standalone thing because I just love the flavors. You don't get as strong of a flavor when you mix it with the rice. So sometimes it's nice to just have a little bowl of it just on its own. And other times it tastes really good on top of the crispy bottom of the pot. The tarig is really good with chorish on it to me. Yeah, I love that. That's one of my favorites. And you can get it actually at some restaurants too. They do serve it like that where you can get an order of the tadik with the chorish on top of it. Mm-hmm. So you talked about reme, which has the kind of like a tomato base to it. Some other ones that I really love are the badimjun and the bamiya. And badimjun is the eggplant stew and bamiya is the okra stew. So let me talk about the badimjun first. The eggplant is peeled and actually you can have it fried. You can have fried eggplant. You can also broil the eggplant to cook it through. But I was thinking something that you might want to try, Bita Jun, is air frying the eggplant. And then you add that eggplant to the meat and onion. You fry the onions and the meat, and then you add some water to it so that the meat can get a little bit more tender. And you add the tomato paste and then your seasonings, your salt and your pepper and turmeric and anything else that you would want to potentially add to it. And then you add the eggplant to it and then you let it simmer. And the best type of vessel to cook this in is usually a flat pan, like a saucepan, as opposed to a pot because eggplant can be kind of delicate. You can let it like simmer away. And a lot of times this is actually served with these tiny, tart, unripe grapes called rure. Mm-hmm. And some people love rude, some people don't love rude. It's a little bit too sour and tart for some people. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a caper. It's not a caper, but it's like a bigger caper. That is a good comparison to a caper. But then you have that on top of it, and then you serve that on rice. And actually, to be honest with you, sometimes I even like that on top of like bread, like a crostini. 
Mmm, I love eggplant. I love all eggplant dishes that are Persian. They're all so delicious. I'm glad you brought up the type of pot you use because for me, it's not a frying pan and it's not a rice pot. What I use is a flat, deep pan Uh that I can put a lid on. Yeah. So for me, that way I can saute my onions and put my meat and add the water or beans or whatever and then put the lid on it and let it cook down and in the olden days they would cook these things all day Mm -hmm. yeah you know in my world I don't really want to spend more than 45 minutes to an hour cooking dinner Mm -hmm. that method works and I'll sometimes play with making chorish in the instant pot to save time as well exactly especially when cooking and braising the meats you could save I think a lot of time doing it in the instant pot because the longer it cooks the meat gets more tender Yeah, and my mom had one of those scary old pressure cookers, Mm -hmm. you know, which is basically an old-fashioned instant pot. Yeah. And everybody was afraid to touch because they thought it was going to (laughs) explode. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have to release the steam on it manually. It's an intense cooking device, but it works. You know, you could really cook your meats really quickly in that. So I just also wanted to talk about bamia. Bamia is the okra, and it's very similar to how we talked about how you make the badimchun. You cook the okra separate, but I just did want to give a little cheat here that it's hard to find okra fresh, and then you have to be careful that it doesn't get slimy. So I've found when I'm craving bamia and I want to make an okra stew, I actually just use frozen bamia, frozen okra from the freezer section of the grocery store. And oh. that's usually one of the vegetables that they do have frozen. So that's my cheat for okra stew. Oh, that's a good one. So we talked about some tomato-based stews. What about some of the herb-based ones? Do you make any herb-based ones? I do. I make carafs, the one that I grew up eating. My mom made it a super healthy way growing up, and I sort of emulate that as well. I make it with chicken. It has a lot of mint and celery. Carafs is celery. Mm -hmm. It's a celery sauce that you eat with your rice. Mm -hmm. But I will sometimes just eat it plain. I love it. And it is another one that can be sour. And I actually heard someone share with me over a connection I had on Instagram with another Persian chef that they started to dry their own mint in the air fryer. So I grow mint, I have a herb garden and I grow fresh greens. And so that motivated me to try drying my own mint and that I could potentially use for Khoresha Karafs, the celery stew. I love the Khoresha Karafs too. Also the Khoresha Karafs, don't forget, has a lot of parsley in it too. And the mint and the celery and onions. And again, with whatever meat choice, that's one of my favorites. And that's a kind of easy one. That was one of like the first Persian stews that I actually ever made. I did want to just touch on gorma sabzi. Gorma sabzi, it's all herbs that are like fried and slow cooked all day that also has like kidney beans in it and usually with beef or lamb. But in an earlier episode, I did say that I actually would never make gorma sabzi just because of the time commitment that it takes all day to cook and braise and simmer that. When I do make korma sabzi, I will actually buy the herb mix. They sell in the Persian markets a frozen variety and a dried variety of herbs that are already chopped, prepped, fried, ready to go. That you basically just have to, if it's the dried ones, that you just have to rehydrate the herbs. Or if it's the frozen one, you just add it to your braised meat and then add the kidney beans and add the limo amani if you want to have that in it and let that simmer for a little bit. And that's like the biggest cheat that there is to make gorma sabzi. I think that's the most popular Persian stew and people love gorma sabzi. And there's actually a pretty big rivalry between gorma sabzi and khoresha karafs, the celery stew versus the gorma sabzi. People will actually hate on Khorisha Karafs because they want to compare it to Khorma Sabzi, but oh. I just feel like let's just enjoy both of them <laughs> versus having to say one is better than the other. But some people have some really strong feelings about that. I did not know about this rivalry. Yes, Khorma Sabzi is delicious. So nutritious, has so many herbs. Of course, in the same way that our special soup, Ashrashta, that has also a lot of herbs in uh-huh. it, in the same way as like Ashrashta to me is so much more delicious when you use fresh herbs. Yes. I think if you had a ton of time to sit there and chop right. vegetables or herbs, then go for it. But yeah, to like get it already prepared in a bag or frozen is a huge time saver. Yeah. 
Do you have any substitutes for kidney beans? Because sometimes I'm in the mood for kidney beans and sometimes I'm not, to be honest. But I like all the other parts of Ormasabzi, the er herb stew. I don't know if this is just a regional difference that they make it, but I've also seen it with black eyed peas. Ooh, I think I would really like that. Yeah. See, now I'm I'm motivated to make it. I'm motivated to make korma sabzi and try it with black-eyed peas. That sounds so delicious to me. Okay, cool. Let me know how it turns out. So we just wanted to point out that there are a lot of different types of stews of khorish in Persian cooking. We're just talking about kind of like our favorite ones that we like to eat and cook. I think my favorite one, which is fisinjun. And fisinjun is ground walnuts that are sauteed. They're basically toasted and it's mixed with pomegranate molasses. And again, with whatever meat that you choose to use for the dish and it's simmered and it is like such a beautiful, sweet and savory, a little bit tart served with rice and tajik and your fresh herbs on the side. And that can actually take a lot of time if you want to make it from scratch. But if I want to make that, I buy the ground walnuts. I don't get walnuts and try to crack them and ground them all like that's going to take a lot more time than I'm going to be able to dedicate to it so you can actually just buy ground walnuts throw it in the pot and toast that up I cook the meat separately and then combine it and then add the pomegranate molasses and add some water and let it simmer it's like a dark brown color if people who don't know it may be a little bit intrigued or may not know what to think about this brown kodesh but once we have a taste of it it changes people's lives <laughs> Ah, it's life changing. It is so delicious. It looks almost like a mole sauce. It can actually be quite different. I've seen it in different shades. Like it can be kind of almost like a light brown or tan and it mm -hmm. can be a dark burgundy almost. So it probably depends on how much the walnut ratio is versus the pomegranate. Mm -hmm. It's rich and it's delicious, but it can be mm -hmm. more sweet or it could be more tart or sour. I maybe have a slight personal preference towards the more sour. The sweet is almost too sweet for like a meal for me. Uh -huh. Which one do you like? I think I like the little bit more tart, but I'll take it anyway. How much you toast the walnuts will also impact the color of it too. How about if I make it in the Instant Pot and report back? Yeah, in the Instant Pot, it'll be really easy, especially for your meats to cook in there and then just add it with the sauce. And again, this is one that definitely could be vegan and still hearty and all those nuts in there. And it actually is made with chicken. Yay. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. It's not like I'm changing it. It's supposed to be made with chicken. Yeah, chicken or duck is actually a popular way to make it too, if people are into that. So today's acid beats comes from Ray from San Francisco, and he asks, are there spicy Persian dishes? That's a great question. What do you think, Pizza? Do you know any spicy Persian dishes? I don't know that I'd call Persian dishes spicy in the way of being like hot or heat in my mouth. Mm -hmm. It's not like that kind of spicy. To me, it's spicy in a good way where it's got mm -hmm. essences and flavors and interesting spices, but not spicy like my mouth is burning and yeah. heat. Yeah. What would you say? I agree with that. There's a lot of spices that are in the food, but the heat spice, there isn't really. I think if you wanted to add heat to a dish... A lot of times people will have pepper on the side, like chilies, basically, sometimes with their sabzi khordan, which is like the fresh herbs that they serve alongside of their food. Similar to how we talked about onions, kind of like a condiment with their meal. Some people will have like a little bite of pepper to add that spice because typically Persian dishes are not very spicy. Well, that's a great question, Bita. This was great. I'm so hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, me too. Let's go eat. All those khorish sound so delicious. And I'm also motivated to try cooking some that I haven't before. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And we look forward to talking to you next time. So you've been listening to Modern Persian Food with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling your friends or giving us a good rating on iTunes. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com for recipes and info that we talked about today. Thanks so much. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time.